And when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Last week, we continued our Sermon on the Mount series, our our summer series through Jesus' longest sermon recorded in Scripture. We find it in Matthew 5 through 7. And last week, we reached Matthew chapter 6, those first few verses, and we ended with this idea of when you give, when you're doing the right thing, do that right thing for the right reasons. When you give, Jesus says, give in secret. Don't blow a trumpet. Don't draw attention to yourself. Don't give to others in need because you need attention Give simply because God deserves the glory. Give generously simply to give God the glory that he deserves. We are a people, we are an organism that are motivated by rewards. Like, I'll do it if. I'll pursue it if. I'll do this thing if. Like, what are the rewards that are in it for us? We are motivated by rewards. And and we see in where we ended last week, that Jesus offers this promise of reward that the Father will give when we do certain things in a way that gives him glory. But what sort of reward is he talking about? When you give to those who are in need, when you give to kingdom causes, when you give to his church, you are not promised a reward of more money. You will hear that from multiple sermons, from multiple pastors across our country and around the world today. That when you sow a seed with God, you'll reap a harvest of more money than things you want. Like we get to pick our prize. I promise you, our our leadership promises that when you give to the needy and when you give to kingdom causes, you will have less money. That's, that's, That's the math. But we still do it because it's all God's. I have nothing in my hands or in my pockets that are mine. The only thing I bring to the equation, we've talked this before, the only thing I bring to the equation of my relationship with God is the sin that made Jesus necessary. And so when we talk about giving to the needy, we're not giving what's ours, we're giving what's already his. And so when we give, we give in secret, and yet Jesus promises a reward. He clearly promises a reward to those who give generously, to those who are in need, to kingdom causes. What does Jesus mean, though, by rewards? We're going to see it several times today. We not only are starting where we ended last week, talking about giving, talking about living and giving generously, we're going to talk about prayer, we're going to talk about fasting, how Jesus would have his followers do those things. And as we go through that, each time Jesus is going to promise a reward to those who do them in a way that gives God the glory that he deserves. But what reward is Jesus talking about? And how should you and I live in order to be living in a way that Jesus goes, that's what I was talking about. How should we live in such a way so that a heavenly father says, that's what I'm talking about, and here is your reward. What is Jesus talking about in the Sermon on the Mount? Will you join me in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, where Jesus says this, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. This is not talking about out loud prayer, that when somebody prays in service, like people are here and they're praying in service, that Jesus is outlawing out loud prayer. He's not talking about prayer just when you're standing, that there was a clear practice in first century uh, Jewish culture where the religious leaders would go to street corners and say, check out how holy I am, listen to my prayer. And Jesus was calling them out for what was something that was them doing what would be the right thing, praying to God, but doing it in a way to get the applause of men. Jesus used this word, hypocrites. Do not pray like the hypocrites. Now, the funny thing about hypocrisy is that it's very easy to sense in others and very difficult to see in ourselves, right? Where does the word come from? It's actually a Greek word, and it's a Greek word that comes from the Greek theater, And it actually comes from people who were actors in the play, and they would wear masks to play multiple characters. They would come on stage with a mask one time, and they're this person. They'd come on stage another time with a different mask, and they're that person. And Jesus is saying is that when you go before God to pray for the applause of men, you're putting on a mask pretending to be somebody you're not. Because you should be praying for the glory of God. To pray for the applause of men is praying for your own glory. Praying to God for the praise of men is hypocrisy that the Lord hates. Now again, it's easy for us to see hypocrisy in others. It's very difficult for us to see it in ourselves. I will put to you, there will never be anybody who has followed Jesus who does not have moments of hypocrisy. 
And the longer that I live and the further that I walk with Jesus, the more I realize how much hypocrisy there's been in my life. It's not something that we're going to be free of this side of heaven, but it's something we should resist. And Jesus is calling out an area we may not have even been aware of. When you pray, don't pray for the applause of men. Don't pray to hear other people hear how smart you are or how fluent you are in the language, how broad your vocabulary is. No, pray. Pray in secret. Jesus is talking about how we should pray. Such people were doing the right things for the wrong reasons to satisfy their own ego, and their only reward would be the applause of men. Look at verse 6. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus told his followers, when you pray, notice the assumption of it. He said, when you give, and he said, when you pray. Jesus doesn't stop to make the case that you ought to be giving, that you ought to live and give generously. Jesus doesn't stop to make the case that you ought to be a person of prayer. It's an assumption from the Old Testament law. Remember, Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And the Old Testament had already made the case of what it looked like to be someone who wanted to live for and worship God. And so Jesus is just clarifying what that means, elevating what that means. So he's not even making the case you ought to pray. He says, when you pray, pray in secret. Pray just to your Father. Find a quiet place and have quiet time with the Lord. Now, prayer to God in secret, I'll put to you, is the secret to Christ-likeness in public. That if we're not spending time with God in private, our public lives are going to struggle. Sometimes we might say we have no time to pray. I put to you, we, don't have, we have too much to do to not take time to pray. One of my friends growing up had a strange room in his home. They, they built the home in a new neighborhood just outside of town, and when they built it, we would walk through sometimes as it was being built, and when it was done, he had this odd little room that just didn't seem to fit. It was off of, it was down a long hallway, off of a laundry room, and it like, what, what is this for? And when they got done with the house and they began to furnish a house, the use of the room became clear. And when they were designing their home, they carved out a space that would be their family's prayer room. That any family member knew they could go in there and close the door and have uninterrupted quiet time with the Lord. They had created for their family a very quiet place. I don't know about you. I've never built a house from scratch. I've never had the opportunity to sit down and go, I'd like this here and this here. It's like, well, here's your house. Make it work, right? Well, maybe you're not looking to design a house anytime soon. If you are, maybe consider adding a prayer room. But if not, how can you and I find a quiet place in a crazy world? Well, Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles, the great preachers and hymn writers of, of years ago, she had a very large family, a lot of children, and the house was understandably very chaotic and loud and noisy. But she was known to sit in the middle of her kitchen, pull her apron over her head, and have a quiet time with her Bible and with the Lord as the kids are going around. They knew when mom's apron was pulled over her head, leave her alone. Probably they'd learned that very well. But she had, you know, let them know, don't bother me, I'm doing that. But she found a makeshift cotton tabernacle in the, mid, in the middle of her kitchen. No matter what it takes in your life, find the place that you go. Carve out the time where you go to be quiet before the Lord and to spend quiet time with the Lord. Look at verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Prayer is not exclusive to the Bible. It's not exclusive to Christianity or to Judaism. You look at any religion around the world, and prayer will be a component of what they're calling their people to do. But prayer in other religions, and I'll add to it, what I'm increasingly convinced of is that we don't have a separation of church and state in our culture today, in our country today. We actually have a state-sanctioned religion of secular humanism, and it is every bit of a religion as any other religion is. They are just worshiping themselves as opposed to worshiping the creator. And so in any religion, that one included, there is typically something that will deal with the power of words, be it a mantra, or what they would say is the power of manifestation. Heaping up empty phrases by repeating the same thing over and over to leverage the alleged power of words. I'll put to you, our words do not have the power to determine reality. Period, end of story. If that's true, I'd be a lot taller and thinner. I can't just keep saying those things for that to happen, right? If, if that was the case, you'd have a new truck in your driveway. If that was the case, you'd have a new home in the mountains overlooking an amazing view, right? 
the power of our words really is the power of ourselves to exert our own, to pursue our own glory, to exert our own sinfulness into the world. That's what we do by our words, but biblical prayer is different. It's not heaping up mantras or manifesting anything by our alleged power, which we have none. That you are talking, you're not talking to the deity or to the universe trying to sway its will to yours. Scripture says you're talking to a father trying to line your will to his completely different approach to understanding what it is to talk to God. Biblical prayer is also not to be complicated. Jesus wasn't talking about if you learn these complicated phrases, if your vocabulary is rich enough, if you're able to weave words together like a master communicator, then God will hear you. No, God, Jesus is telling us, no, reject complexity is the secret to praying effectively. That's not what you're doing. Just simply embrace the intimacy of one who identifies himself as a father. He could have chosen any number of ways to identify himself, and he is identified as king and lord and God and creator. But he over and over and over again, when it talks about relating to people, God chose father. That's a staggering thing to consider. Jesus reveals this this intimacy by saying that almighty God is also our father who knows what we need before we even ask. He's our father who knows what we need before we even ask. I try my best to be a good father. Short of being a follower of Jesus and a husband to my wife, my most important earthly role is to be father to our sons. And I take that role very seriously. But I have no idea everything that they need before they even ask for it. I do not have the power to crawl inside their minds and in their hearts and know the deepest things. We try and have open communication and have a, have a healthy relationship with them to be able to hear from them. But at the end of the day, I can't know everything. But your heavenly Father knows the numbers of your hairs on your head. He knows the number of your days before any one of them came to be. And he is close enough to catch every tear when it falls. Your heavenly Father knows you. But with that being said, Let's dive into that a little bit more. Jesus is talking about this intimate relationship of a parent to a child. And yet we've got to understand an error that has happened within the Western church. I don't know how long it goes back, but it's certainly prevalent today. This idea that everyone is a child of God. I put to you, Scripture doesn't make that case. Scripture does not say everyone is a child of God. Scripture says God has children. Scripture says God has a family. But it doesn't put every human being who's ever been or ever will be within that context. Every human soul falls into one of two categories. Every human soul is either a child of God that has been saved by Jesus and brought into the family of God. Or every human soul is an enemy of God who is a part of a broken world that is heading toward judgment and destruction. Not everyone is a child of God. But Jesus died to make a way where anyone, no matter how far they've gone, can be brought from death to life and become a child of God. I put to you that's better good news than trying to say that everyone is a child of God. God made a way through Christ for enemies of God to become children of God. That's the good news. But also do this. I'm fully aware that if you've lived any any amount of time in this world, even if you come from what the world would say, this is a really good family and you know, had a really healthy upbringing, none of you had perfect fathers. I'm not a perfect father. None of you are perfect fathers. None of us had perfect fathers. Perfect fathers don't exist short of heaven. Many of you may struggle when you hear God described as a father because you look at your life and you look back at your history and your father is responsible for the worst parts of your life. And so to hear God described as a father makes him seem even more distant. It isn't a comfort to you. For many of us, it's a comfort because our fathers were flawed, but our fathers were faithful. But for many of you, that seems like an incredibly foreign concept because your father is the source of maybe many of your wounds, maybe even most of your wounds. But we have to understand when Jesus describes our heavenly father, we cannot view him through the lens of our earthly fathers. Our heavenly father surpasses the best moments of the best fathers, and he's completely absent of the worst moments of the worst fathers. If the best father, all of his best moments, was all you ever experienced, God the Father is even better than that. If you are in Christ, you have a perfect heavenly father. 
I want you to hear this this morning. Your father wants to hear from you. When things go wrong in our relationship with our parents when we're young, one of the very last things we want to do is come home and tell them what we've done. Last thing we want to do is come home and tell them what we've done. You know when you get home there's punishment coming, and you go in knowing, maybe some of you didn't know this, I grew up knowing when I came home with bad news, I was going to get a bad response. It was going to be a furrowed brow and folded arms. And my dad had a reaction to things when things didn't go well for him. When he was disappointed in you, he would shut down and not talk to you for days at a time. It's the way he reacted to things. And sometimes we bring that image of our earthly father to our relationship with our heavenly father so that when things go wrong, we don't want to go tell him. And when we do go tell him, what we think we're going to get is folded arms and a furrowed brow. But the story of the prodigal son tells us, no matter what the child has done, the father is out by the road looking toward the horizon, waiting for the son to come over the hill. And when he sees the son, he does not fold his arms, and he does not furrow his brow. He spreads out his arms, and he hikes up his robe, and he runs to greet the son who wished he was dead. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the Heavenly Father who wants to hear from you. Look at verse 9. Jesus says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither Will your father forgive your trespasses? We know this passage, one of the most famous passages in Scripture. And people who don't know a whole lot about the Bible know how to quote this, don't they? People who may have very little moments within a church building know how to quote this. The Lord's Prayer is something that everybody knows. But the context of it and what it means to us and what, like what Jesus is trying to accomplish through it, is it something we could and should repeat as a group? Yes, that, that's true. But Jesus wasn't going, here's what I want you to repeat back to me. That isn't exactly what he's doing. Sometimes this is not called the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes it's actually called the disciples' model prayer. It's a whole lot less catchy and less memorable, but probably more accurate. This model prayer is Jesus teaching his followers how to pray. We see a similar prayer recorded in Luke 11, and what prompts that teaching is the disciples said, Jesus, Lord, Master, teach us to pray. We, we don't really know how to pray. We pray, but we don't know if we're doing it right. Jesus, will you teach us to pray? And I think what Jesus is doing is he gives his followers and gives us the Lord's Prayer as he gives us this, this teaching on what it looks like to pray to God in a way that honors God and gives him the glory that he deserves. He's really giving us sort of a roadmap with mile markers. You're giving somebody directions. Now you just give them the address. They plug it into GPS. When you were growing up, some of you are old enough to remember you used to give directions based on there's a big tree by a fence, right? You get to the KFC and you take a left, right? You did it by landmarks. I think Jesus is providing for his people when you pray, these are the landmarks you want to make sure you see. So what does it look like? I think one of those landmarks is family, that you go into prayer recognizing that if you are in Christ, you are a child of God. So family, you are saying our Father in heaven, this is where we get the title, Heavenly Father, is from this line right here, that we have a father who's not an earthly father, who's flawed and doing his best, hopefully. We have a Heavenly Father who's perfect in every way and knows our imperfections better than we do and still reached out to love us through Jesus. Second, we not only are part of a family, but we are coming to God, so we come to him with the awe that he deserves. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed means sacred, holy, worthy of praise. You aren't talking, I don't know if you remember these, this is an old t-shirt, Jesus is my homeboy. You remember that, that t-shirt? It's like, no, that's, that's a complete wrong. Is Jesus closer than a brother? Yes. You do not want to diminish him to the point of calling him a homeboy. This is God the Father seated on high, the one who Isaiah saw and collapsed before him, the one who John saw the risen Lord collapsed before him. Like this is power and authority. Having awe for the one who is hallowed is the way to come to God in prayer with confidence because we are his child, but with reverence because he is God. Third, your kingdom come. That's the hope 
is that the hope we have for a world that is broken, the hope we have for a world that is wrecked, the hope we have for our lives and our bodies that are flawed and broken too, our hope is God's kingdom coming. That's the only hope for the broken world, is that his kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Our only hope is that God would have the final say in how all this works out, and Scripture is clear that he does. Next, your will be done. This is the struggle. It is very easy for us to pray for God's will to be done in the lives of other people. It is very easy for us to pray for God's will to be done in Washington, right? That's not as easy as it used to be. But it is easier to pray for that than it is to pray, God, in my life today, let your will be done. God, in my heart today, let your will be done. God, as I work trying to get through a list of things that's way too long, Lord, your will be done. This is really hard to pray for our hearts and for our lives, but prayer is entering into that struggle, inviting God to rule and reign over every part of our life. Give us our daily bread. This is a confession of dependence, that God is the source of every need that we could ever have met, that God is the source of the meeting of that need. And so when we say, give us our daily bread, it's a recognition that no matter how hard we work, we can't produce bread on our own. Everything we do, every need that is met is using something that God has already created and provided. He actually placed the need within us. Where we go wrong is trying to meet the need apart from him. So relying on him for daily bread, total dependence on him is the right way to live. Forgive us our debts. This is talking about forgiveness. We have wronged God more than we even know. And so for us to have confession be a part of our daily lives, a regular staple within our prayers of confessing, Lord, I did this. I think sometimes we are so numb to sin, we don't even recognize that we need to confess it. We need to have a heart that is so tender to the things that offend God, the things that rebel against God, that we are driven to confession right away. We're not waiting till the end of the day. We go, Lord, I know I just snapped at that person. or Lord, I know I was just short with my child. Or Lord, forgive me for how I acted on the streets of Manatee County, right? That we need to confess the ways that we don't look like Jesus so that our hearts are tender to it and we don't let ourselves get calloused to the presence of sin in our lives. Jesus said not only to forgive us our debts, but for us to forgive others as he's forgiven us. He even goes so far as to say that if you're an unforgiving person, it may be a sign you're not forgiven by God. That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? That if we don't have a heart that's set toward forgiveness of others, Jesus' warning is, Check your heart to make sure God has it. He also says, lead us and deliver us. This is entering into the battle. We have an enemy without and an enemy within. Lead us away from our flesh, the enemy within. Our flesh wants to do the, do the right things for the wrong reasons is how bad our flesh is. Lead us away from our flesh and deliver us from the lies and the schemes of our enemy from without. Some, some, uh, of, your, some of your Bibles either in brackets or parentheses, maybe in a footnote, they add a part to the prayer that we didn't read when we read what's in the text. Some New Testament manuscripts include, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Not all New Testament manuscripts that we have of the ancient text include that phrase. Some do, some don't. By its non-inclusion in the ESV, more than likely, most don't include it. And so it's not wrong to say it as part of the Lord's Prayer. Every single part of it is altogether true, and it's altogether right to pray that. It's just interesting to see that somewhere along the line, somewhere in the manuscripts, more than likely someone added a line that was important to the early church that was not a part of the original part that Matthew wrote. Now, realizing this, what is this prayer all about? This prayer is all about God. It's all about God. Here's who you are. God here's what you do. God, here's what I need, and I can't get it from anywhere but you. And God, I've wronged you. Here are the things that are wrong about me. And celebrating all of who God is, giving him the praise that he deserves, it's all about God. Sometimes our prayers are reduced to, Lord, here's your memo for the day. Here's your marching orders and action items of the things I really think you ought to consider adding to your day, because let's be honest, I know what I'm talking about. And the world would be a whole lot better if you would just make sure you do the things I told you to do. We don't say that out loud. But doesn't sort of the content of our prayer sort of confess what our hearts actually kind of think? God, my prayers are all about me. So make sure you take care of what I told you to do. 
Does God want to take care of us? Most desperately. But if God met every one of our requests, I actually look back through my life, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost more thankful for the things God said no to than the things God said yes to. But I can see things that I went at one point, God, if you would just, God, I really want you to. God, I'm please asking you to. And he ended up going, no, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's the last thing you need. In the moment, I'm like, God, why? With hindsight, I go, oh, I think you know better than that. That shouldn't be an epiphany. But if we're honest, we probably need that epiphany. It's all about God. And even though it's all about God, sometimes we need reminders of that. Look at verse 16. Jesus goes to the next topic. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. There's that word again. For they disfigure their faces for their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who's in secret. And there again, see it. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, fasting is a word that you did not hear outside of church settings for much of my lifetime. You would hear it before you're going into surgery. They'd tell you you fast from midnight the night before until you head into surgery. You may have heard it in church settings, but outside of that, you really didn't. You hear it a lot now because of intermittent fasting as a means people use to lose weight. And you could have intermittent fasting be a component of what Jesus is talking about here, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Fasting has a specific goal. Biblical fasting is the practice of abstaining from food for spiritual purposes, things like seeking God, repenting of sin, interceding for others. Fast could be from certain foods. You could fast from certain things as a means of denying yourself and focusing on God. It could even be, and within our culture, I think there's great benefit to it, to fasting from media, to fasting from possibly even hobbies. But Jesus is talking specifically about food. And he's not asking us to do anything that he didn't do. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness before he started his ministry. Went out there at the end of those 40 days. He's tempted by the enemy. But he spent 40 days fasting from it to spend time with his father, to be prepared to head out to do the mission his father had given him to do. Like giving and like prayer, Jesus warned that we could do the right things for the wrong reasons. We could fast in order to get the applause of others. Why do you look down today? Oh, I'm fasting. Oh, you're looking a little off, like, like, like there's something wrong? Oh, I'm, I'm just fasting, right? Drawing attention to yourself of look how spiritual I am by what I'm doing. Jesus is saying, like, when you fast, focus on God to really only let God know that you're doing it. That means you'd lie to somebody, but you don't draw attention to it. So why should we fast? Jesus assumes we will. Notice he doesn't go, you ought to fast. What does he say? When you fast. Again, the assumption, when you give. The assumption, when you pray. The assumption, when you fast. Fasting is a way to remember how much we need God. John Piper, in his book, Desiring God, said this. You've probably heard the quote before. I know I've shared it before. God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him. And fasting is putting ourselves in an uncomfortable situation to be reminded of how we found satisfaction apart from him. In the depths of our fast from food over a long period of time to not eat, your body will go, it's time to eat. You drive that craving toward God as opposed toward satisfying the hunger. And so when you do that, when you're uncomfortable, that dissatisfaction of the abnormal reveals the ways you found satisfaction apart from God. Piper drives home this point even further about what fasting is really calling us to see in ourselves. In his book, A Hunger for God, he says this, if you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, It is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. Fasting is not talked about in the church a whole lot because we're content to nibble at the world. We're content to experience the pleasures and the distractions and the diversions of the world. God wants us to have our lives be consumed with a focus on him and a hunger and a thirst for him where nothing will satisfy but him. The studies on how people people within the church use their time and the things they value and the things they'll pursue, the way they use their time and their money and the way they'll, they'll, they'll pour out their talents for something. In many ways, it's revealing the fact that we've been satisfied doing earthly things, and adding a little Jesus on the side. That is not what the Sermon on the Mount is calling us to, and it's not what we want our church to be calling us to. 
It's clear in Jesus' words that when you give, that when you pray, that when you fast, all assumptions, that when you do that, you are turning your heart and your mind toward the only one who can satisfy, the only one who matters, the one who gives us life and gives us purpose and gives us meaning. And if our life is not all about him, Scripture would say we're wasting our life. But remember, in each of those circumstances, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, what does Jesus promise? He promises a reward. We're all sitting here thinking, well, what's in it for me? Like, I, like, I'm not, like Kel, I know, you, know I ought to. Like, I can see I probably ought to, but what's in it for me? What's the reward that Jesus is talking about? Catch this. This is very important. When God's children seek him, he rewards them with more of himself. Here's here's what I know. For many of us, we heard that and we went, oh. Many of us, we hear that and we go, that's not the prize I would have selected. Why? Because we've nibbled so long the pleasures of this world, that we're too full to realize how much we need God. It may not be the prize you pick, but that's because we've settled for a very low view of who God is. The writer of Hebrews drives home this point about that God delights to reward those who seek him. When he wrote this, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Do we want the reward of more God? That's the question. Or are we content with the morsels of this world? How then do we seek God? If that's what we're called to do, if what Jesus is talking about here is a life of seeking God by by giving generously, by praying continuously, by fasting regularly, what is he calling us to do? Well, in those three things, we see the foundation of what really are the spiritual disciplines. Now, for some of you, that's a very familiar word. For others of you, it might be a completely new word. Spiritual disciplines are the regular practices that God uses to help us seek him, know him, and make him known. Spiritual disciplines aren't the goal of our lives. It isn't that we get spiritual merit badges by doing these things, but these are the things that we do that the Lord uses to till the soil of our heart so the Holy Spirit can do the work of making us more like Jesus. If you are a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you surrendered your life to him, You are saved by what Jesus has done. But now that you are saved, it should radically change what you do. And one of the things that ought to be changing is your focus on what Jesus would, or what what, what the church has called spiritual disciplines. And Jesus is hitting three of them today. Spiritual disciplines, if you think about a list of them, the first three are this, prayer and fasting. And what, what I would probably put together is like stewardship and generosity. When he talks about giving to the needy, you're, you're giving out of the overflow of what God has given you, and you are a steward of that, and you are responsible for living generously with that. Time and talent and treasure, it's all given by God and all used for his glory. But those are the first three, they're not in any particular order, the first three of spiritual disciplines. But what are the other ones? You can see them referenced multiple times in Scripture, and there's been a lot of people who have studied this over time and looked at the work of the church and how God works in the life of his people to make them more like Jesus, let me give you some more that you could incorporate into your life. The next one is pretty clear, Bible reading. Bible reading um, is the breath. You're, you're breathing in the truth of God's word. We, we live in a world that's, that's just packed with the smog of uh, futility and sin, and we breathe it in all day, every day. At some point, we need a nice, clear, lung-purging breath of God's truth in our lives and in our hearts. Bible reading is bringing that in. You could find, if you don't know what to read or how to read or where to start, it isn't necessarily the best tactic, like, like open your Bible and close your eyes and point. That's not the best way to consume Scripture. One of the best ways to do is just have a plan and follow the plan. We provide one for you. The Good Life app is, is something you can download, tap or scan on that sticker in front of you. It has a link at the bottom to the Good Life app for Apple or for Android, and within the Good Life app is a Bible reading journal plan. You can go through the New Testament in a year. You can go through the Old and New Testament in a year, but it gives you a plan to follow. Spend time breathing in God's Word by reading God's Word. 
We also have hard copies of that on the Next Steps counter in the lobby. But there's another way you can interact with God's Word, too. The second one is Bible study. If the first is breath, this is talking about depth, that you are diving deep. This is taking time out of your life to do a deep dive into the things of Scripture. And you're like, where in my life am I going to find time for Bible study? Well, let me ask the question, and I don't mean to step on any toes other than my own first. How much time do you spend on the deep dive before fantasy football draft? How much time do you spend on a deep dive of a character from a movie that you love and you want to find out more about it? Or shows coming out that you want to watch, maybe a new season of something that you love and you want all the inside information about the season before it comes. We know what deep dives look like. We've started at one topic on the internet and found ourselves 12 topics later going, why am I looking at cat videos, right? Like, we have done that a whole lot of times, haven't we? I'm, I'm, I'm just calling us and calling myself to go, I know how to do a deep dive. Maybe I ought to bring that same hunger for depth to the Word of God. Make Bible study an important part of your life as well. Next, and we've already mentioned this one, confession being a regular discipline in your life. That prayer is going to be a part, but don't be praying just with a list of things you want to tell God he needs to do. No, go, God, tell me what I need to hear. Reveal my sin to me. Search me, O God, and know me. Try me and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way within me. And then confess that. Confession, all that is wrong with us. God, see it, fix it, remove it, make me more like you. Along with confession, sort of the flip side of that is praise and worship. If confession is all that is wrong with us, praise and worship is declaring and celebrating all that is right with God. When God, you have done great things. Thank you. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I praise you that you are the creator and sustainer of all. I praise you that you are big enough to hold the universe in the palm of your hand and you're close enough to know what's going on in my life. One of the ways for us to as we are going through this process of growing to be more like Christ, we're not saved by what we do. We should be radically changed by what we do as we go through that. One of the ways to document that, to remember and to revisit is journaling. We provide for you out in the lobby a good life journal, a good life church journal, a way for you to take notes during the service, for you to take notes while you're reading God's word, for you to take notes while you're praying. Lord, today I prayed for this thing. I'm I'm asking you to do something amazing in the life of this person that I know who's sick. Lord, I'm asking you to call this person that I love from death to life because they're lost without you. And we're writing that down. We're praying about it because at some point you'll be writing along and God will have done something for that person who was sick. And God will have moved in the life of that person who was lost. And you get to go back and revisit and remember God's faithfulness, what you were learning, what God was teaching you. Another one is solitude and silence. We talked about it a little bit before with the prayer room, going into secret. But it's hard to find solitude and it's hard to find silence. It's also very difficult to find both at the same time. Amid all the commotion of life, is it any wonder that sometimes God feels far away because we don't ever get still and quiet enough to even hear from him? God feels very distant because we're just around too much noise. We spend very little time when something is not turned on and making noise. We're listening to a podcast. We're listening to the TV. We're doing something other than being still and knowing he is God. Let me give you a couple tips for that. Have a daily quiet time. If it is just a very small start of finding a Bible reading, there are, we have the Bible reading journal on our app, but there's also uh, um, Bible reading apps for other things. We can get even very, very small. Like start with something. Don't let it be a destination. Let it be a step toward growing in Christ. Have a daily quiet time, a regular time, a regular place where you know you're going to spend time with God. Also, if you can do it, I encourage you, I encourage myself, make getting away a priority. Whether it be for an afternoon, you're going to go to the beach with your Bible and a journal and just spend time with God. Maybe even if you, if you had the opportunity to do this, like plan a weekend where you're just going away by yourself to be able to spend some time with God. Some of you may live in a season where you're like, yeah, right. Okay, well, that's fine. But have the daily things there. Here's another one. Minute retreat, redeeming the small moments that, sent, that would otherwise be filled with scrolling Instagram or staring off, you're in the elevator with somebody, right, and you're trying not to have awkward conversations with them or whatever. Like, turn it into a moment of prayer. Here are some short prayers you could pray. God, give me the strength to serve you today. I can't serve you unless you help me. Give me the strength I need to serve you today. God, renew my mind with your truth. There's a lot of lies out there. 
Renew my mind with your truth. God, remind me of your goodness. Remind me of your love. Help me know you are who you say you are. God, help me love like Jesus today. And God, give me the right words to sound like Jesus today. That's a hard one, isn't it? Whatever the case may be, solitude and silence, spending time with God, you'll never get off go in your spiritual walk till time with God is a high priority in your day. Here's the next one. We aren't meant to go through this alone. Silence and solitude have their place, but we also need community and accountability. Life is better when life is shared. We gather for worship. We also circle up to share life. Both are important. We also hear the good news in order to share the good news. Next is evangelism. Sharing the good news. This would be having a regular practice of the disciplines will give you the confidence to, be, to, to boldly share the good news. Many times we don't feel adequately prepared to share the gospel with somebody because we spend no time soaking in the gospel. If you'll spend time in the spiritual disciplines, there'll be a confidence to you, not in your strength, but in the work of God in you, to do, for, for God to do work through you. Evangelism is an important spiritual discipline. And last but not least is serving. This is sharing God's gifts with your church family and in your community, to meet needs, to share love, to uh, fill a gap in the lines of the church that needs to be filled, bring your gifts to the table, to serve to make a difference, and then use those gifts to make Christ known in your community and beyond, across the street and around the world. There's a number of books I could point you to on this, and I don't always share books with you, but these are four that if you want to know more about this topic, would be worthwhile for you to hear. Uh, One is Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, a great classic book written in the late 70s and still uh, relevant today and still um, powerful today. Habits of Grace by David Mathis is a newer book. Uh, but also very powerful, A Place of Quiet Rest by Nancy Lee DeMoss, 2002, written directly to women, but beneficial for all. Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, 90, started in 1991. Donald Whitney is, uh, gets high praise for the way he writes about the spiritual disciplines. And he provides, in a different book, questions that I want to use for us as we close. There's a lot of things we could do talking about a message on prayer and a message on fasting and a message on what it looks like to do the things that a follower of Jesus does so we can be more and more and more like Jesus. I want to end with 10 questions that Donald Whitley put in a book that I thought were really good, diagnostic questions to get a good gauge of where we are spiritually, for us to be able to look at these questions and go, Lord, where am I? Where are the areas where I need to grow? Where are the areas where I have some strength and need to need to exercise that muscle, and where are some areas where I have some spiritual weakness that I need to do better? Let's run through these quickly. Do I thirst for God? Our lives probably reveal a thirst and a craving for a lot of things, but does it reveal a thirst for God? Does it reveal, do I still grieve over sin? Have you become callous to sin where it doesn't bother you anymore? Or when you sin, does it bother you and it drives you to confession and to repentance to go the opposite way? Am I a quicker forgiver? I'm not sure that's great grammar, but it's a true statement. Am I quick to forgive others just as God has forgiven me? And am I more loving today than I was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago? If our answer isn't yes to those, or if our answer is sometimes to those, or I wish it was more than it is, then we've got something to work on there. You get an area where you go, Lord, this is an area where I need you to work in my life. Next, am I sensitive to God's presence? Am I recognizing that God is everywhere all at once and he's always there? And am I sensitive to his work in my life? Am I concerned for others or am I often more focused on the concerns for myself? And am I governed by God's word or am I governed by the opinions of the world or by what the news media says or by what I want in my own life or satisfying my own desires? Am I governed by God's word and by God's word alone? Last three, do I delight in the church? Is church an accessory to my life? Or is church my family and a place that I call home? Do I value the big C church, the body of Christ? Do I value my local church? And am I living my life in a way that makes that church stronger? Are the spiritual disciplines important to me? Are they present in my life? And God, do I yearn for heaven and to be with Jesus? I remember being a certain age. And there was a part of me as a teenager going, Jesus, I want to see you, but I sure would love to get married first. I don't have quite that thought anymore of like, Jesus, I'd like to see you, but here's these other things I'd like to do. The older I get, the less I feel that. I guess if there's anything that's there, it's, Jesus, I want to see you, but can you hold off long enough for this person to come to know you? 
Jesus, I want to see you. But I'm really fearful that some people that I love are going to spend eternity apart from you. Do we have a longing to see Jesus in such a way that we can't help but share Jesus with those around us? I want to end with this. Give you an opportunity to pray quietly, right where you are, to practice a spiritual discipline, right where you are. I want to call you to do one of two things, maybe both. God, help me want to be more like Jesus. I think sometimes our desire is for something else. So God's got to give us the desire, and then God's got to accomplish the work. But God, help me want to be more like Jesus. And God, help me see you as the ultimate reward. I'm going to give you a moment to pray as the band comes up and plays quietly, and then I'm going to close, and then we'll sing a song. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. This morning we got to gather together and sing songs of praise. But we got to open up your book and hear the words of Jesus declared over people who wanted to not just be fans of his, but to be his followers. Words that step on toes. Words that bring inspiration and, and conviction. Lord, words that give us the roadmap, the landmarks to a life that honors you. Lord, forgive us. Lord, Lord, forgive me. Is there any way in my, my life and in our collective lives, Lord, that, that we have settled for satisfaction in the things of the world? That we hunger and thirst, but not for the things of you. That we want to do the right things, but we do them for the wrong reason. Lord, I pray you would just throw open the doors of our hearts. Shine a light in the dark corners we don't want to talk about. Lord, Cleanse us, purify us, refine us to be more like Jesus. Because we live in a world that's a mess. We live in a world that is, satis that is satisfied with nothing, nothing less than whatever they want. And Lord, our desires of our hearts naturally from our flesh will lead us to destruction. You have given us the antidote. You have given us the good news of the gospel through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, let our lives look more and more like him because we are committed to spending time for you to do the work in our hearts. Committed to doing the things that till the soil. We're committed to being more like Christ. Lord, I want us to be a church family where the lost come to hear the good news. Where those who are saved are living out that salvation story. I want us to be a people who look like Jesus. It's in his name that we pray.